Welcome to the long overdue second part of our series on one of the most wonderful groups of pterosaurs, as Darkids. I really didn't intend for there to be a gap of over a year between episodes, and I know many people have been awaiting this second video, so sorry about that, but it's here now, at last. In this video we're going to be taking a look at just how these incredible animals managed to take to the skies and stay up there, and the remarkable anatomies that made this possible. So, first of all, it's important to realise that these animals were absolutely capable of flight. Despite some claims, often triggered when people see reconstructions of the bizarre looking proportions of Asdarkids in the air, there is a huge amount of evidence supporting their competency at flying, meaning even the largest of species would not have been fully terrestrial, as is surprisingly often argued. This issue is described by paleontologist, excellent paleoartist and pterosaur expert Mark Witten as arising when people, who may perhaps have knowledge of planes but not much of an understanding about pterosaur biomechanics, refuse to believe that such a ridiculous animal could perform powered flight, and at most must have simply been gliders, or only been able to fly when they were younger and therefore smaller in size. However, as Witten puts it, there is no debate about giant pterosaur flight among those of us who study their fossils. The press and social media fuss about the topic is a genuine paleontological controversy. So let's have a look at how giant Asdarkids flew. Of course, the first stage in their flight is the takeoff. Just how did a 250kg giraffe-sized animal get off the ground? Well, until relatively recently it had been assumed that Asdarkids, and indeed all pterosaurs, took off in a similar manner to birds, using their hind limbs to power a jump into the air to initiate flight. However, this method of takeoff has been found to be quite inefficient, since large muscles are needed in their legs to provide enough energy to jump and start flying, after which they become dead weight in the air that are not really useful in the locomotion of the animal until they come to land again. So, if pterosaurs were using a bipedal launch system like birds, this results in a restriction of how large they could actually get, with values of just 75 kilograms for the biggest as darkids if they were going to be able to launch themselves and get into the skies using this method. Very unrealistic weights. But this is where the quad launch hypothesis comes in. This suggests that pterosaurs took off from the ground on all four of their limbs, not just their hind limbs, pushing with their arms to get the thrust they needed. There's a lot of good support for this idea, which can be seen in detail in Mark Witten's blog post linked below, and I'll quickly summarise some of the main points. First of all, it's clear that the primary limbs used to launch a big animal into the air are going to be stronger than the limbs that are not used in launching. Therefore, as we can see in birds, the hind limb skeleton is relatively quite robust, whereas the wing skeleton is more gracile, and the bigger a bird species is, the stronger their legs become in order to power the leap that starts flight at larger masses. Additionally, both of the limb girdles in birds, the shoulder and pelvic girdles, are enlarged and allow for strengthened musculature to be attached at these locations. However, when looking at pterosaurs, paleontologists have noticed that the forelimbs are in fact relatively stronger and more robust than the hind limbs, completely unlike birds. Also unlike birds, only the shoulder girdle is enlarged, and the pelvic girdle is relatively small, meaning not as much big musculature would be attached here. This is actually one explanation for why pterosaurs were able to grow to such larger dimensions than flying birds ever have all the muscles for launching and powered flight are located in the same region in these prehistoric animals, whereas with birds there's enlarged musculature in two different places, meaning quad launching organisms are far more mass efficient than bipedal launching ones, and could therefore achieve greater sizes while still being capable of taking off. Then there's also evidence from pterosaur trackways, which illustrate that these creatures walked on all fours, significant to this argument since it's been noted that there's a correlation amongst today's powered flight capable tetrapods between the limbs used to walk and the limbs used in launching. Birds, as we've seen, walk on two legs and also take off with those same two legs, whereas bats walk on all fours and are quad launchers. So, using this comparison, pterosaurs, which according to the fossil record walked on all fours, likely also took off with four limbs. Otherwise, there's a complete contradiction with the living animals we can observe around us today. So, it's a pretty solid hypothesis that nicely explains how such incredible creatures were able to fly. But once the pterosaurs were up in the air, how exactly did they stay there? It seems quite unlikely that the largest members of this grouping were taking off all the time, and would probably only have taken flight if they needed to avoid a predator, or about to travel over a significant enough distance. Indeed, despite their clear aerial proficiency, as darkids were also very well suited to life on the prehistoric ground, as we saw in the last episode. 
So we should perhaps consider the giant as dark a takeoff frequency as analogous to the very largest of the currently living flight capable birds, organisms such as albatrosses and swans. In this case, these pterosaurs were probably soaring and gliding for most of their time in the air, with short bursts or flapping in order to maintain their altitude or search for an updraft to keep them airborne. Although, it's also been suggested that as darkids could continuously flap their wings while flying, thanks to the powerful and enlarged musculature used for flight. The way in which these animals utilised their muscle power would also seem to be another key to getting these reptiles into the skies and getting them to stay there. It would have been impossible for large as darkers to take off, even quadrupedally, using just aerobic muscle contractions. Instead, they would have mainly utilised more powerful anaerobic muscle contractions but this would then have meant they needed to rest their muscles. Additionally, the powerful flapping of their wings would have required the use of anaerobic contractions too, meaning that after a series of flaps to propel themselves, the pterosaurs would have then needed to switch to a more restful glide. In a paper published in 2010 by Witten and another pterosaur researcher, paleontologist Michael Habib, some absolutely astonishing conclusions on the true extent of giant as darked flight ability were reached. Through the use of pterosaur flight model software, it was found that these incredible animals would have been able to transverse some remarkable distances, with a short burst of flapping lasting just under 2 minutes being able to propel these creatures at top speeds of over 100 km per hour over more than enough distance to find another updraft of air to begin soaring again, in which time their muscles could then rest and be ready for more flapping. It's also been calculated that these giants would have had enough energy resources, such as fats and muscle tissues, within their own bodies to be able to fly constantly for around 16,000 kilometers, and at no point having to come down from the skies. This is a truly massive distance, and means big as darkids could have easily travelled around the entire planet if they wanted to, making these animals the ultimate rulers of those ancient skies. And, as Mark Witten again points out it's important to note, these values are obtainable using a modern day gravity and density of the atmosphere, and they therefore don't have to have been different in the past to allow for giant as darkids to take flight. Finally, certain papers that have found as darkids to be too heavy to fly have all been debunked in more recent studies that identified some crucial problems with the methods used in them. One of these papers, from 2009, used comparisons with petrels, albatrosses, and shearwaters, concluding that at any mass greater than about 40 kilograms, takeoff in giant pterosaurs would be impossible. However, there are a great deal of issues with using these birds as direct comparisons for as darkids, since there are many differences in their biology and the way they fly, in addition to, as we've already seen, a lot of disparity in their takeoff mechanisms and the distribution of muscle mass. Then there's a 2010 paper that calculated a body mass of over 500 kilograms for Quetzalcoatlus, a value that would indeed probably make this animal too big to fly. However, the reconstructions the models in this paper were being based on turned out to have a torso three times the length it should actually be, and when this was corrected, the mass went down to between 200 and 250 kilograms, a perfectly acceptable value that still works with the flight models. Also worth noting is that much, much smaller masses have also been calculated in the past, reaching as little as 50 kilograms, but this would simply be impossible for an animal the height of a giraffe to realistically achieve. It's important to remember though, that even with the huge heights and wingspans the Azdarkids could get to, these were animals with significant skeletal pneumaticity, meaning their bones were filled with air spaces. So, although not weighing as little as 50 kilograms, this bone morphology allows them to still be surprisingly light for their size. So, there we have the arguments that have been made for giant as darked flight, and as you can see there's a lot of pretty good evidence in support of this being a possibility. Of course, these pterosaurs were still also well suited to living on the ground, and likely would have spent a good deal of their time there when they were alive. It's therefore not completely out of the question that someday in the future truly terrestrial as darked will be found one which was absolutely too huge to get into the air, or had a morphology that just did not allow it. But for the moment, all the giants of this group appear to have been quite capable of taking to the skies, a feat of nature that must have been an incredibly awesome thing to witness. I'd highly recommend having a look in the description of this video at the sources I've used if you're interested in this topic. The blog posts by Mark Witten are very good and go into a lot of technical detail, I'd also recommend getting Witten's excellent book on pterosaurs, linked below, which was used in the making of this video. Now unfortunately we'll have to end the video there, as I've decided to make a third part to this Asdarkid series. But don't worry, it should be out much much sooner than this one was. 
In the next episode, we're going to explore the various different lifestyles that have been proposed for these pterosaurs, and see which of them is most likely to have been the true way these remarkable reptiles lived. But, just before we go, we have a very exciting announcement to make. We're going to start doing a Paleo Art of the Week sort of thing at the end of every Sunday video from now on, in which we'd like to feature an artwork by one of you as a way to give back to this wonderful community. You can make any sort of artwork you like about any organism, not even necessarily an extinct one, and then submit them to us on our artwork chat on the Discord server, or by tagging us on Instagram if you like, and then we'll select one to go at the end of the next video. Make sure to also include your name on any social media accounts you'd like us to credit you by, such as a DeviantArt or Instagram account, so then people know where to find more of your art. We just thought this would be a really cool way to celebrate the incredible artists in our community, so I hope you like this idea. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.